beep. All right, why do your reverb suck? Why do your delay suck? Today's video, I'm gonna show you guys the most common mistakes I see with my students, my mentees. I'm also gonna be showing you guys some cool things that people are always asking about in the music that I work on. How'd you do this? I can't get my delay to do that. My reverbs, why is that? In hopes that it finally all clicks for you. Now, the reason that most people's reverbs and delays suck is that they think return tracks are for old people. They think sends, returns are, are, are for the old, that it's an outdated way of thinking and I disagree with you guys a hundred percent. Now in order to access return tracks in Ableton, it's gonna be on the right side. We're just gonna click S and R. Now what I want you to look at return tracks are gonna be channels where you can put time-based effects like your echo, like your reverb, like your delay. And these channels aren't gonna have any sound until you use a send to send the signal from a sound into that channel, into that return. And in channel B, I have some reverb. And now I can send this particular synth by increasing my send. Notice that it's starting to produce volume now, but if I don't have the synth going in there, that channel is not doing anything because that channel is meant to get penetrated by sound. Sound is meant to go in it and out. Now, why is this important? Well, because majority of the time with amateur producers, having a reverb in a return track is like a safety net. Because remember, as I do this, I'm sending this sound there, but the sound is still getting sent to my master. It's not getting sent from here to here and then from here to the master. No, the routing is from here. It's going to go into the master. And from here, it's also gonna go into the medium verb. And that's one of the most powerful things you can have in music production. So why is it an outdated way of thinking? Now, the reason most people say that is because the reverb just never sounds the same. It never sounds big like they want it to. So if that's the case, learn to program your reverbs. Now, as a vulgar educator that has been teaching people now for 13 years, I have been signed to Armada, Universal, Spinning. They still get impressed from this kind of delay. Ain't trying to hold you back, but I know I told you that. Show you how you're supposed to act. Supposed to act. Like that delay amazes everyone. I have students that will come to me and say, how can I do that delay? Because every time that I have a delay, I can't seem to get it. Like they're just trying to get one specific syllable to delay out, but they, they can't because for some reason the whole vocal is delaying when they increase the dry and wet. I wonder why. This is where again, a return track is gonna come into play. It's super clutch because watch, I can choose any word I want from this vocal to get delayed and I don't have to do anything crazy. All I have to do is insert the sound when I want that syllable it's on. So for instance, if I wanted ain't trying, to, ain't trying to delay out a lot, that's the one I want, then I insert it into the return at that exact moment. These are the little like ball tickler sounds or like effects that people like always go like how do you how do you do that but again if you've ever wondered how to make those kind of delays that's how you do it and then from there just get the timing right and now you know now, i believe this is going to answer majority of the questions on why your reverb and delay suck ass um in your music and that is because you're not using return tracks or because you think it's an outdated way of working and i recommend that you don't think that way there are instances where you're gonna have a reverb or a delay as an insert but majority of the time, I teach my students to have at least at least uh, a half delay, a one eighth, a one sixteen delay set up in returns. Their two favorite reverbs, one of them that's long, one of them that's medium. From there, as you get comfortable with return tracks, you're gonna do amazing things because your creativity is gonna go wild and you're gonna feel the power of them. Now from here, returns are gonna help a lot in getting your reverbs to suck less because you're gonna be able to EQ, compress, pan. You can treat the reverb being created as its own entity. For instance, let's say I decide to go crazy with. First off, I can EQ the highs out if I want a very dark reverb. Like there's a lot of good examples in Tech House where like BLR, you know, he has a track where the reverb makes the track. You know, one of my students asked me like, how did he do this track? I was like, because he fucking EQ'd the reverb in a return and he was able to widen it because from there he can use an auto pan, get it to like move to the left and to the right. Check this out. Now, if you're like, nah, I don't want a damp reverb. I don't want it to sound like we're at a club. I want it higher.
It's a John Christian trick from back in the day. I recommend you guys look him up on YouTube. Now that I'm allowed to cue the reverb because the, there's no synth behind that that I have to worry about, I can do a lot of really drastic cuts. I can get creative. I can cut heavily. The other thing that you can do is automate your reverbs more efficiently. And what that means is that as let's say you have a track and you want to create like this um, endless smile, this sort of washout, then you can use a utility from Ableton and you can automate the gain on it to do really cool stuff. Now this is how it sounds like in context. Here it comes. Yeah. And then you can automate it off when you need to. For example, here I can bring in all that damn atmosphere that's being created. From here, this is a trick that's been beaten to death that everyone probably knows by now. You can use a compressor, you can write your synth into it so that it sidechains the reverb out of it. I can have that synth sidechain it by going into my sidechain, going to synth stuff, and then lowering it down. So I'm just essentially picking the channel that we are in. Now I get like the W and W effect, the David Guetta future rave effect, the shh effect. The next thing that I want to talk about is reverbs. A lot of people seem to think that we need like long fucking reverbs. But in reality, what I want you to think about is this. If you have a synth sound that is playing every 16th, which by the way, it's going to be like, what, like one millisecond, every two milliseconds or something. Now, if I haven't converted you to return tracks by now, then there is no hope. But no, you know, be open to it. And if you like the idea, then use it. It's something that I see success with in people that I teach it to. But here's the next thing. This is a question I get asked a lot. What decay time do I need to be at? So how do I answer this question in a way that people want people that have professional jobs that want to make music on the weekend and don't want to spend too much time discussing theory and blah 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 i always give them a set stone number like my mentors did for me until i finally understood how to use it properly and that is if you are making music and your intended effect with the reverb is not to create atmosphere in the sense of then no more than 2.5 seconds of decay time that's what I teach my students. Set that in stone. That way they don't have to worry about it because we don't want decision fatigue to play a role as they are setting up countless of reverbs, okay? Now, the reason 2.5 is the one I give is because think about it like this, right? Let's say that you want to put reverb on this synth sound here. How often is the synth sound hitting is the first question you have to answer. Now, majority of people, when they use synth sounds, they're going to be you know, hitting constantly to play melodies and play arps and stuff. So for this one, we can say we are in a 16th range, right? So a 16th range, if we highlight this at 0.11 milliseconds, you have a lead that's constantly hitting, inducing reverb, constantly being inserted into a, a fat filter pro R, creating the reverb. So if your intended effect is not to get that <laughs> fucking this, then there's no reason to be up here. We're creating enough room and majority of the songs that most people come into our sessions with, they're going to have reverbs that are very like, my mentor said, you know, it's good reverb when you can't tell it's there. So reverb that creates the intended effect that most people want to use it for. And that is to put the sound into a space, not to create a blobbing pile of. So once we have that, we can ease up on it. And we can create a reverb that sticks to the sound versus muffles it. Now I'll give you guys an example on why you might want to create a, a, a big reverb for say. Here's the sound I have in this track, which hits once and then it's empty. Okay, so this is a reason why I might want to use a long reverb. Maybe I want to create that intended effect of the woof. So then, and it covers that field until we reach the next sound. Now from here, I can use the inside of this reverb, the, the, the tools I'm given to cue it, right? But now if I want to do anything to this reverb, well, I can't because let's say I want to cut some of the highs out. Well, I'm going to be cutting some of the highs out of the main synth. But whenever you have a sound and you're trying to add a long tail to it, then it makes sense to use reverb with long decay time. Now, the last thing I want to add, and I also want to say this one with a bit more of like... It depends, but also like 
don't set this in stone. But one thing that also helps a ton in just getting cleaner reverbs throughout music for most of the people that I teach, you know, that I guide is using maybe one or two types of reverbs and that's it. Now, this is a very outdated way of thinking because I was talking to techno producer Yumik and he talked about it as well. For him, if it sounds good, it sounds good. But when you're guiding people that are getting into it, for me, I, I have to teach them to cut back because there's just so many possibilities in the music production world. So I try to cut them back as much as possible so that when they finally understand stuff fully, they can do the creative stuff that they want. But no more than two reverbs. And if you can, use the reverb from the vocal on the synths so that you put them in the same space and create a sense of cohesiveness. Ain't trying to hold you back. And then the synth. It sounds like they're in the same space. Okay, guys, and I think my rant is over. If this video helps you out in any way or it creates an aha moment for you, consider subscribing. And if you want to support the channel, make sure to head over to evilsounds.com where you can find all of my sound design work. My sounds are used by some of the best producers out right now, like James Hype, Mal P, David Guetta, Space92. And as always, I hope that you guys have a great day producing. Now, if you guys want to continue your knowledge forward, I did make a video on how the professionals make bland leads sound more pro like utilizing dub delay utilizing swells utilizing layers utilizing accentuation if these are terms that are a little bit like foreign to you watch this video educate yourself on them so that you can try it in your next song